So uh, welcome uh, to this uh, uh, early um, our ESAS uh, session on Shine Like a Rockstar. Uh, my name is uh, Manoj Lalu. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Ottawa in Canada and associate scientist at the uh, uh, Research Institute there as well too. So I'm a, I guess I'm an early anesthesia scholar myself. Um, and uh, I'm one of the moderators along with Boris here. So I'll let Boris introduce himself and uh, he'll let you know how the session is going to be run for today as well. All right, thank you all for coming and for staying. Um, <laughs> I'm Boris Heifetz. I'm a clinical assistant professor at Stanford. And I actually, uh, in light of Max's talk, I just uh, want to point out that Max is the person I credit with going into anesthesia. I was an undergraduate when he was finishing his PhD, and uh, he was the only person I knew who went from basic science into anesthesia. And so I called him a few years after that, and he uh, tried to talk me out of it, but eventually, uh, <laughs> here I am, for better or worse. Anyway, so. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so we have, a, a, again, going on with the theme of uh, hearing about all kinds of different pathways uh, to success. We have three outstandingly successful uh, faculty up here who I'll introduce. And uh, again, the theme of this uh, talk is shine like a rock star, different paths to success. And we tasked our speakers to come up with a couple uh, answers to several questions. So first, what was their biggest challenge? And how do they uh, how do they adapt or overcome overcome that in the course of their career? Uh, number two is how much influence did funding agencies and the departmental or institutional need direct their career path? So these are some of the pressures that are going to exert their influence over your career. And then finally, what's the one piece of advice that they would give early career anesthesia scientists? So I'll introduce uh, all three of our speakers, and then um, we'll bring them up. So Dr. Paloma Toledo is an obstetric anesthesiologist and assistant professor at the uh, Center for Healthcare Studies in Northwestern. And her research focuses on understanding and reducing racial and ethnic disparities in peripartum care and improving the quality and safety for women delivering in the United States. And she completed her clinical training at Northwestern University and uh, after an obstetric anesthesia fellowship, uh, she completed an AHRQ funded T32 training grant and got her master's in public health at Northwestern. Uh, since then, she's been funded by an AHRQ F32 award, and she received a career development award from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and is currently funded by the AHRQ. She's the chair of the Foundation uh, for Anesthesia Education Research and an associate editor for ANA. So next, we uh, have uh, Dr. Peter Nagla who's recently, very recently, appointed to be professor and chair of the Department of Anesthesia and Critical Care at the University of Chicago. So he's a, he has a home field advantage. And uh, prior, prior to this appointment, he spent most of his academic career at WashU and St. Louis, where uh, he had uh, NIH funding with research program and post-operative cardiac events and um, looking at nitrous oxide and treatment-resistant major depression. Uh, which is something I'm personally interested in, and uh, clinically served as the section chief of trauma anesthesia, and has strong interest in innovation and entrepreneurship. And uh, it sounds like he has a spin-off company from his uh, nitrous work called uh, Nitro Biomedical. And finally, Dr. Uh, Laureen Hill uh, on the the far right. So she finished her anesthesia residency at Stanford. Uh, and did a fellowship of critical care medicine, cardiac anesthesia, and pediatric anesthesia with a focus on congenital heart disease. So that's uh, a lot of punishment, and I applaud that. <laughs> um, she was on the faculty at Stanford as assistant professor until July 2000, and then she was recruited to Wash U, uh, where I believe she worked with Dr. Uh, Dr. Nagla. And her, uh, she developed a new cardiothoracic intensive care unit service and a CT critical care uh, training program. Then she went on to develop uh, one of the largest anesthesia-based uh, preoperative evaluation clinics uh, in the country. And then uh, it sounds like she took a little bit of a veer off into a different direction and then went on to get an MBA because all the fellowships, I guess, weren't enough, uh, <laughs> enough training. Um, and so that was uh, at WashU in 2006. So uh, she served as vice chairman at uh, of the department at WashU for seven years. And then she was recruited to be the chair at uh, Emory School uh, Anesthesia uh, Department in 2011 and has now, I think, uh, landed at, as a senior vice president and chief operating officer at New York Presbyterian Hospital Columbia, where she's responsible for daily operations, including cost, quality, and delivery of services. And I think they have a lot of uh, fellowships that you can probably pursue there as well if you get, <laughs> if you, if you get bored, bored of that. So without, without further ado, Dr. Toledo. 
Thank you so much for the invitation to speak this morning. I'm really excited to, to come back to your group. It's always inspirational to see so many people who want to do an academic anesthesia career. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how to be successful as a clinician educator. You know, usually when people hear, oh, I do education work, they're like, oh, that's a resident project. You're never going to get funded. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can be creative with your work in education and be still impactful but get an academic career going. So I have nothing to disclose. And today I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about how you get promoted as a clinician educator. I'm going to talk about how you frame educational projects in a way that you can actually accomplish research. I'm going to talk about funding educational research. And then I'm just going to give you my general career advice. But I'm Hispanic, I'm Cuban, you know, I can't do just one thing, so I'm going to give you a couple. So. Um, I think the most important thing, if you want to do educational research, is look at what your institution asks you to do if you want to get promoted as a clinician educator. So this is the Northwestern website for faculty uh, promotion and tenure. So just go to your institution and see what does it take, because again, most of us are really great at following checklists, right? So you just look at what I need to do, check off the box, and see what see what needs to get accomplished to be promoted. So at Northwestern, you know, we have a couple of domains that you need to excel in if you want to be a clinician educator. So obviously, teaching and education is the first. But you can be promoted as a clinician educator through research, through clinical impact, and health services management. So starting with teaching excellence. Just being a good educator in the operating room is not enough. It is the expectation that all faculty members teach residents and that you're good at teaching residents, right? Because who wants to be on faculty at an academic institution and just go to work, you know, sit quietly in the OR, start your case, bounce out, and then not do anything? So the expectation that you teach is always there. But the thing is, you really need to, if you want to be on this clinician educator path, excel as, a, excel as an educator. So you need to have evidence that your teaching evaluations of medical students, of residents, are really excellent. So the other way that you can do this it, in terms of you know, checking off the boxes for your promotion is making sure you get teaching awards. Again, institutional teaching awards, national teaching awards. Make sure that you can document, I am a good educator. The other thing is you also need to have evidence that you have national and international recognition. So again, when you get these invitations for visiting professor invitations or when you get asked to speak at a national meeting, take it because again, this is documentation that you are a good educator, that people want you to come and talk to their groups. So you have to make sure that you do things that make you feel a little bit uncomfortable. Like I personally am very shy. I think you know, there are a lot of things that I would rather do than speak in front of a whole room of people. But you have to push yourself and really do things that make you feel a little uncomfortable because that's the way that you get recognized. The other thing that's really important is making sure that you document your teaching in, in ways. So every institution has started to develop teaching portfolios. And if your institution doesn't have a teaching portfolio established, um, look at some examples and see what does it take to be an educator in anesthesia and what are the different things that you should be collecting and documenting so that you have a teaching portfolio and you can show evidence of your, your excellence in teaching. So for Northwestern, you have to show that you teach in courses. And again, it's not just the interoperative teaching. You have to teach in the medical school. You can teach in the graduate school. You can teach at CME courses. So looking at these things. But another way that we can talk about being educators in anesthesia is through mentoring. And again, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Foundation for Anesthesia and Education and Research because I think that there are a lot of overlap opportunities here. But again, take all of those medical students that you work with or residents that you work with and then show that not just did you mentor them, but that the mentoring resulted in some kind of uh, scholarly work. So did your mentoring result in publication? So here's one of my favorite examples. It's actually the first paper that I got published in anesthesiology. So I, for many years, have mentored students in the FAIR Medical Student Anesthesia Research Fellowship Program. And I've prided myself on trying to make sure that at least every student that comes to my, my quote unquote lab uh, gets a publication. And so what this student did as his side project was we looked at all of the students who were in the FAIR MSARF program and we looked at how many of them published. And so here's my med student who now has a publication in anesthesiology. So again, make sure you take your educational projects and turn them into something that you can 
document because it's always easier to count publications. I think that's the difference between people that are on the research track and people that are on the educator track. The researchers have publications, they have grants, it's easy to look at what your productivity has been. As educators, it's a little bit harder, but it still can be done. But now I'm going to talk a little bit about how do you frame your research questions um, for educational projects because it takes a little bit of creativity, but it definitely can be done. So this is the first example that I'm going to talk about. So again, I'm an obstetric anesthesiologist, and what do we talk about? Postpartum hemorrhage. When you think about maternal mortality, what kills mothers across the world? Hemorrhage, hypertensive disorders, blood clots. So postpartum hemorrhage is something that kills one mother at least every seven minutes worldwide. So this is a huge problem. And again, I'm a little bit older, so you know, when I trained, we didn't have quantified blood loss. We had to look at these various you know, things and say how much blood there was on them. So you, know, you had to be a little bit good about saying, ooh, this looks like 2,500, that looks like a liter, this looks like that. So we didn't have any way of quantifying blood loss. And I personally thought, this is pretty terrible because you know, mothers are dying, and we should be able to quantify blood loss better. So this is something that's ripe for an educational project, right? So what I did first was look at, you know, okay, so we know that estimating blood loss is a problem. How can I do this? So I designed a study so that we could look at what the actual blood loss was. And so here on the y-axis, you have the difference between the estimated and the actual. On the x, you have the actual blood volumes in these simulated scenarios. And what you can see is anything above the blue line is they overestimated. Anything underneath the blue line is they underestimated. And basically what I found was that small volumes of blood loss, people overestimated the blood loss. But then when you got to the big blood losses, the thing that actually kill moms, they were really underestimating the blood loss by about 40%. So again, you can teach people how to estimate blood loss better. So what I did was I broke out this question into a series of projects and then I published them in a, very, a variety of journals. But the first one was, can we train people to be better? The next question was, does it matter if I train them in person? Or do I, can I just do it online? You know, because obviously that's less resource intensive. And if I can accomplish the same goal, that's fantastic. And then I did a follow-up study to look at, well, once we train them, do they retain these skills? So again, we did a simulated project where we asked them to estimate the blood loss. Then I developed a didactic training so that they could better estimate blood loss. And we went through what our postpartum hemorrhage protocol was. So we, we trained the people that were working in labor and delivery, anesthesiologists, obstetricians, about what they needed to do. And then what we found was that accuracy improved with training. So again, looking at that zero mark, people were really bad before they did the training. They got better with the training. And they still retain some of the skills nine months later. So again, I went through these projects and I actually published them. So I have documentation of clinical productivity turning into research publications. But then I took it the next step further, the research impact of these works. So our work on postpartum hemorrhage, like my little simulation projects, actually were the backbone of the state of Illinois postpartum hemorrhage project. So everyone in the state of Illinois, every two years, who works in a labor and delivery unit, needs to be trained on how to estimate blood loss and they need to be familiar with how to manage postpartum hemorrhage. So again, you can take your research project on an educational topic and have significant public health impact. Again, my work has been cited by the World Health Organization. So you can take an educational project and really move the ball forward in clinical care. This is another example of what I've done with an educational project, and I'm going to talk a little bit here about how to be creative about taking your educational project and framing it in a way that you can get funded because, again, academic anesthesia, you don't have a ton of time, so you need to get funding to buy out your time to do research. So I did my OB anesthesia fellowship at Northwestern, and here, you know, we do have a pretty diverse group of patients, and I realized that Hispanic patients and black women were less likely to use labor epidurals than white women. So I was really curious about like why there was this disparity, and I really wanted to understand it. And there hadn't been much in the anesthesia literature. You know, there were a couple of papers that showed that there was this racial ethnic disparity, but no one had really looked prospectively. No one had tried to really understand why is there this difference in women using or not using labor analgesia. So the problem that I had, and this is one of my take-home messages, is in my department, there wasn't anyone who could help me develop this research project a little bit more. You know, we were amazing at clinical research. You know, I could do a clinical project with my eyes closed. But, you know, something like this that was like more health services, that needed qualitative research, I didn't have the mentorship that I needed 
in my department, so I went outside of my department, and I found a mentor who was a national expert in healthcare disparities. She actually became the disparities lead for PCORI a few years after um, we started working together. And I found an obstetrician who was a health services research. Again, we worked collaboratively to help develop the projects that moved my research question forward. But here comes the funding issue. So really, if you think about it, this is the reaction you get from most people when you're like, I want to talk about racial ethnic disparities in pain management. They're like, huh, most people deliver in a couple of hours. It hurts, but so what? Who cares, right? So you had to like frame the question so that people cared about what you cared about, right? Because again, I'm Hispanic. I feel that there's this burden of pain. How do I sell this story to funders? So four million women deliver in the United States every single year. But if you think about it, if minorities are really the number one, uh, minorities are outnumbering whites for births, and they're having more pain, minorities are really suffering more and shouldering the burden of pain in the United States. So now, I felt like I had an argument that could resonate with funders, but then you have to find places that will fund your work, right? So you know what you want to do, and ultimately you want to develop an educational project, but there isn't something to just fund that. So you have to deconstruct your question in a way that you can find funding to support it. So the first study I did was basically to quantify the, the disparities. So I found a funding agency, a foundation, that my work overlapped with. Then the next step was I wanted to do some qualitative work. So I went to ARC, and they funded some qualitative work. So I really took the question. I really built up the argument for why I needed to develop this educational intervention. And then I went to the Robert Wood Johnson, and they, founded the, um, they funded the development of the counseling tool that we built. So again, everyone naturally draws to the NIH. You know, everyone wants to be on this career path. You get your T, you get your F, you get your career development award, you get your R, and then it's a happy story, right? But when you're an educational researcher, <laughs> there isn't that happy story sometimes because you know that the NIH doesn't fund a lot of educational researchers, so you need to be creative. And there's many places to go, but you just need to think outside of the box as an anesthesiologist sometimes. So there was this article that was published in Academic Medicine last year, two years ago, sorry, um, that talks about where you can go for funding as educational researchers. So there are a lot of places to go. You just need to go and then take your research question and see what you can do that you can fit what funding agencies want. Because at the end of the day, I think finding funding and turning that um, funding into publications is what matters. And then again, putting a plug in for FAIR. Um, FAIR also has a research and education grant. So for it supports 40% of your time for two years. $100,000. So again, if you're doing an educational project, FAIR, our own foundation here in anesthesiology, has places for us to go. And I think, again, one of my other big lessons for people that are doing research in anesthesiology is publish your work. If you don't publish your work, you're not disseminating it, so the impact is lost. So again, there's places outside of anesthesiology and a and I think every paper has a home. It's just a matter of finding the right home for your paper, and who cares, you know? Like, I get rejected right and left. Like, I turn in grants, I get rejected. I turn in papers, I get rejected. Just turn it around, go somewhere else. So there's other places to go. And so to end with my general career advice, um, the first thing is find something that you're passionate about. I can't tell you how many people told me when I wanted to do disparities work, they're like, oh, you're so great. Your postpartum hemorrhage work was really important. You know, it has that public health impact. Like, why don't you just stay with that? Who cares about disparities? I cared, and I wanted other people to care. So I never gave up on the projects that I loved. But again, going back to the education portfolio, again, if you're doing educational research or education in general, make sure you maintain that teaching portfolio because there's nothing worse than coming up for promotion being like, ooh, what did I do back in 2016 and going backwards. So keeping it going prospectively is really important. Find the mentors and collaborators who support you and will help you succeed. But I think, again, as early stage investigators, you know, you find those people that are really excited in the department, they have a ton of passion, and then you ask them to do everything because they're awesome, right? You want them to recruit residents, you want them to be the face of your department, but you need to know when to say no because there's only so much time and like, at the end of the day, you really can't do everything and do it well. So go to your mentors. When someone asks you about this great opportunity, say, hey, they just asked me to do this. Do you think I should say yes or no? And it's okay to say no. Um, so again, Really lean on your mentors before you make commitments. 
Let no, problem, let no project go unpublished. I cannot stress this enough because if you think about it in our specialty, you know, only 20 to 30 percent of abstracts actually ever turn into publications. If we change that here and you turned all of your abstracts into a publication, we really could amplify the, um, the academic physician scientists and the anesthesiology. I think it's really important for all of us to work on getting funded because, again, that will show that there is um, an importance to the work that is being done in anesthesiology. And then my final ask of you guys is make sure you mentor the next generation of physician scientists. Again, I can't stress enough how important it is for you guys to bring other people along with you. You will be successful. You are here in the room. I know that you have the drive and the passion. Make sure you bring someone else up with you. So with that, I'd like to thank you. And then I'll follow up someone else's slides.